we hit record as a secondary. So welcome to another indoor air quality training session here with Sales Management Solutions. And uh, because it seems like we work all hours, we're recording tonight live with Halloran Mechanical here in the greater Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania region, because the business hours never seem to end. <laughs> so uh, tonight we're training with Katie and Jason of Halloran Mechanical. And uh, I'm actually going to set up a quick little screen share in a second here to pop over to our presentation. But right now in our industry, a lot of things are going crazy right now with the IAQ sector. And uh, so here, here's the uh, Halloran Mechanical for anybody who wants to watch this video and you want to check them out here in the Allentown, Pennsylvania region. But obviously, uh, Jason, you guys service the entire Northeast PA region, would you say, correct? Mostly Greater Lehigh Valley, Pocono region. What else? Does that cover it? It's Southern Pocono's Lehigh Valley. Okay, there we go. So cool. So that being said, um, I appreciate you reaching back out and uh, actually targeting some indoor air quality discussions because uh, for the past, well, all of COVID, <laughs> I pretty much have taken over all of the training for the Ultravation Factory uh, for basically their specialists in the IAQ sector. When I say IAQ for people who watch this video, it's indoor air quality. And that's what uh, Jason and Katie wanted to reach out and review tonight because a lot of people don't know what to do. They don't know what to target. They don't know what to address. Uh, they don't even know where to begin when it comes to HVAC. So that's why we're going to review that tonight and jump in. So I'll obviously be your trainer. You guys can hang out. And then as a question pops in your head, please get me to pause. Uh, but in the meantime, let's jump right in. So sounds good. All right. So the purpose of this training is this is pretty much the highest level agenda. We're going to define IAQ technology uh, we're going to actually understand better about what UVC and UVGI means. These are these are buzzwords in the industry nowadays. Uh, obviously, the ASHRAE recommendations. ASHRAE is the, I mean, Jason, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Would you say governing body over the industry of HVAC? Yes. Yeah. One so, of them. One, of, but yes. Yeah, one one of the main ones. One of the main ones. Yes. So. Yeah, one of the main uh, ones. And I would say during this entire pandemic transition of 2020, as we're recording this at the end of the year, um, ASHRAE has put out tons of updates. They have a lot of content on their organization site, a lot of things in connection with what the CDC has recognized and approved. And I'm going to discuss a few points in that as well. Uh, so obviously, we're going to discuss products that actually align with those guidelines and recommendations that ASHRAE and the CDC recognize. And then I might even hit on a couple of things, just how Ultravations products do differentiate from the competition. Uh, because I do want to clarify, I mean, Ultravation is just one of ma many factories out there. So IAQ and indoor air quality, it addresses a big part of our lives that we just take for granted, right? So a lot of us just are just happy to have comfortable homes. So in the summertime, we want them to be a little bit cooler. And in the wintertime, we want to be a little bit warmer. Uh, or in the case of last week, a lot warmer because it hit like 18 degrees, I think, the one day. So, uh, but when it comes to IAQ, and what Ultravation, the factory that we represent, can actually impact, we're going to just narrow it down to three areas of filtration, UV disinfection, and UV air purification. There are other facets that do impact IAQ. And Jason, you're the contractor, you're the expert. But at things like uh, humidification, dehumidification, uh, bringing in fresh air, things of that nature, are other elements that I can't discuss because I can only discuss what I can represent. So these are the three main areas of a system that we're going to discuss tonight. Um, as far as some technology terms. These are a lot of buzzwords that get thrown around. And admittedly, uh, until 2020, I never even threw around UVGI that much. So let me clarify that right away. So there's a lot of UV products out there. There's UV lamps. Uh, there's UV for coils inside of your HVAC system. There's UV products for your air ducts. Uh, this goes residentially and commercially. Uh, but then there's UVGI as a terminology. So and per this definition, it, it's simply put is you cannot basically apply UVGI technology in HVAC unless you're using products that use UVC wavelength lamps. And the reason why UVC is an essential component is there's different UV frequencies. And I'll show you guys on a later slide coming up how the different UV applies. But when it comes to what is recognized by the CDC that can actually kill uh, airborne bacteria and viruses and break them down at the cellular and if not nuclear nuclear uh, level, you need to have UVC wavelength light. So when you're installing products into an HVAC system, if you're going to follow the ASHRAE handbook and ASHRAE guidelines, they refer to it as you're installing UVGI technology into an HVAC system. Now there's other terminologies get thrown around that they 
it's been around for a while too, like actually many years. There's PCO, there's ionization. Uh, but at the root, root core of what we're discussing tonight, we're focusing on the UVGI technology involving UV lamps. Now, PCO is another added benefit. Photocatalytic oxidation is how you say that, how it spells out, something always fun acronyms. Um, but you can't pull off photocatalytic oxidation unless you have a product using UV light. And then you have to have components on that apparatus that have titanium dioxide, which is a coating. And I, I, I can show you that, that later as well. But basically, products have titanium dioxide coated on them. And then when the UV light shines, it reacts. So the titanium dioxide is basically a catalyst. And then the reaction from that creates photocatalytic oxidation. So I say that because, uh, and actually I'm gonna show a quick little video here just to help demonstrate that. And it will have some sound here once I play it. So let me switch the screen share over and let the video define for you guys uh, what we're talking about when it comes to PCO. So stand by. And I'm gonna hit play and pause real quick and make sure you guys can hear this. So do you hear this? Here's how it works. Did you yeah. hear that? All right, let's rock and roll. The UV Photomax Advanced Oxidation Module is coated with an exclusive titanium dioxide formulation. When UV light is applied to the surface, the titanium dioxide coating becomes energized, causing it to release electrons. The electrons then combine with oxygen to create what are known as superoxides. The titanium dioxide then collects replacement electrons for moisture in the air to become charged particles known as hydroxyl radicals. Together with the superoxides, a powerful photocatalytic oxidation, or PCO field, is created. As odors, germs, mold, and other VOC organic molecules approach the PCO field, they are disassembled as the oxidizers pull electrons from them. The purification process is completed, with the remaining molecules recombining to form simple water vapor and trace amounts of carbon dioxide. Ultravation's advanced oxygen. All right, so that's a quick animation on what is happening inside of an air duct where a product that happens to be providing PCO as an added technology layer. That's what's happening that we can't even see to the naked eye. And honestly, from a UV perspective, you don't want to even have a naked eye looking at UV light, especially the UVC frequency, you could literally burn your eyes. That's why these types of products are installed inside the ductwork where no one can look at it. And this field is created. So as the air is passing through 24 seven, as your HVAC system is running, it is passing through these invisible fields that are created to help break things down as the video explained. And then obviously the only thing left behind is trace amounts of water vapor. And, and nothing harmful. But the whole point here is PCO adds another layer uh, beyond what UVC light is already doing as an added benefit. So we always like to clarify that because um, prior to that, and I'll go back to the technology slide here. There's another technology that's talked a lot about these days too is ionization. Now ionization has been around a very, very long time because basically someone figured out how to harness lightning. So when lightning shoots across the sky, it actually charges airborne particles in our atmosphere. Um, that's why sometimes after a really intense lightning storm, you may notice the air smells different. So it's, it's actually a more sterile smell. Uh, but ionization is literally the positive and negative charging of particles in the atmosphere. And they basically get drawn to each other. I mean, we're going back to like old school childhood science class here where, okay, I charge this and, and positively I charge it negatively like a magnet, right? And then they're drawn to each other and they adhere to each other. That's basically what ionization is doing. Ionization was around actually longer than before HVAC even recognized using UVC lights and UV technology and UVGI, we were using ionization first. So, but right now, as I'm recording this with you, what is recognized by the CDC, what has already been published by ASHRAE, we're focusing heavily on just UVC lamps and UVGI technology. There is supposed to be something new coming out about ionization that's going to reinforce that ionization is supposedly effective, you know, in breaking down bacteria and viruses that there's a lot of companies that have already taken a position on that. But from this training, I'm leading with UV because that has been the proven by the scientific method time and time again, we do make ionization products too. And we use ionization technology in our products, but I have to at least draw that line in the sand until we get an updated review coming from the ASHRAE, right? So we're just going to stay following the guidelines, following the rules. But um, that being said, 
let me at least show you a quick animation. There's no sound on this video. And these, these videos I'm showing you guys, they're on our YouTube channel for sales management solutions. So this is all public information. I just like to work it back in and show people. And one of the re reasons why I love ionization is this is a great way to actually improve filtration in a home or a business. So it doesn't matter if you're using our high-end filtration that Alteration makes, but the whole point of these little ion generators or ionization technology is, as you can see with the animation here, is your those little char charged particles are gonna attach themselves to everything from virus and bacteria and everything else, and it's gonna actually break them down and make them weak. But the other side effect of it, as you saw, as you saw there, is besides the fact you're gonna break these things down and potentially help kill them, but they're also being drawn to each other, making the particulates larger. So we all know, Jason, from basic filtration, if somebody's installing like a cheapo one-inch air filter from like Home Depot or, or one of those big box stores, and they don't have a high level of MERV rating, you're not going to have a high quality of IAQ. And historically in the contractor space, like that animation right there, we're showing a nice high-end pleated five-inch MERV, MERV 11 or MERV 13 filter. That's what alteration sells. We only sell... MERV 13 and MERV 11 class filters. Um, historically, most contractors I've trained, they might stop at like the MERV 8 level. And because a lot of contractors have been afraid of working with anything beyond that because of pressure drops and they have to over-engineer the systems to be able to get the air through. Would you agree with me on that? Yes, that's where the five inches comes into play though too. Aha, now wh why do you say that? Surface area. Ah, there we go. So thank you. That was something that I love clarifying for people. So yes, the one advantage of not just having a five incher, right, is the pleats are bigger. But I, for, for example, Alteration's filters that you helped install in my own home, mind you, um, is that's that has they have thirty two feet like length, thirty two square feet of filtration surface area inside that one filter. So you have way more surface area available to trap particulates. That also ensures that they don't have to weave them as tight either because also our filters are rated, especially the MERV 13. It, we have just released a new article about this off of our site literally last week, this past week, discussing the new updated releases from ASHRAE on what, is, what makes a HEPA class filter, right? So a lot of people hear HEPA and they think HEPA is a brand. Well, from an IAQ perspective, HEPA is a high level of particulate trapping filtration. So this is what's used in you know, airplanes and everything else. So you have to be careful when you say a HEPA class filter because everybody automatically thinks HEPA and they're like, oh, I can't work with HEPA. It's gonna, it's, I have to over-engineer the system. I'm gonna have pressure drop problems, et cetera. But to your point, Jason, well, all it's all in how that filter is made, right? Is it a five-incher? Do you have increased surface area? And the most important component that we just released our position paper on is, is it a electrostatically charged filter? The other advantage of the fibers, if they're statically charged, and our filters are, we our technology is called ultra strand, but um, it is helping draw particulates into the fibers and get them trapped. And there's actually been a position study release showing that even filters can actually improve and remove bacteria and airborne viruses from the air. So we can be talk all we want about UV, obviously it's above and beyond, but I always tell people, I, I, I'm not, I don't even want to talk about putting UV in your system until you've at least improved your filter. If you're still using that cheapo, I don't even know what Home Depot and Lowe's and all those big box stores sells. I mean, is there even a MERV rating on those filter, Jason? The, some of them, yes, there's a MERV rating, but they're very restrictive. Right. You're, yeah. we call them compressor killers in the industry. They make us a lot of money. There you go, pressure droppers, right? Yeah, because it's it's because yeah. the, the the compression has to work so much harder. To your point, that hopefully that thing will last the warranty period. And if it doesn't, I mean, you guys had to come back and replace it under warranty, and that that obviously costs you time and money. But if it's after the warranty period, well, now people are having to pay for another whole compressor or eventually new equipment. So we want equipment to last as long and as efficiently as possible. But uh, good points. So now uh, back to my point here, as far as terminology goes. So. The, the biggest thing that we've been training on beyond filtration then is obviously going beyond these technologies and repositioning everybody back to understand ASHRAE position, right? So if you opened up chapter 62 of the ASHRAE handbook, and this image is directly out of their handbook, all they talk about here in this chapter is surface and airstream, right? What do we install to keep the coil surfaces clean? 
or inhibit growth on those because those areas have a lot of moisture, uh, especially in the summertime. That could be a, kind of the petri dish effect. Uh, you, Jason, have, have actually cleaned my own home, right? You've serviced our equipment. You've come back and say, yeah, let's clean the coils, okay? Um, Airstream, obviously, that's what the induct solutions, that PCO animation we just went over is happening in the air supply. So that's really a two-pronged effect, right? We've already hopefully addressed filtration. Then we got to worry about de disinfecting or keeping those areas clean within the equipment. And then obviously in the primary air supply before the trunk, you know, the trunk dissipates and splits off in a home or in a business, et cetera. So that being said, let's at least clarify now UVC. So anybody who's oh, I, supposedly it's very not healthy, but do not anybody who's ever sat in a tanning bed <laughs> to get ready for a vacation or stood in a tanning booth, uh, or honestly, you actually, <laughs> maybe Katie's done it. Uh, it's, maybe my wife has done it a few times. Um, that's UV light. Granted, it's not the same spectrum. There's different spectrums of UV light. So that's why this, this uh, top graph here is great because we see even things like x-rays used in the hospital medical industry, right? X-ray machines give off a certain frequency. Even uh, our sun, our sun gives off a certain frequency of UV light entering our atmosphere. Uh, so there's visible light and non-visible light, right? X-rays, you can't see them. Visible light, you can see them. Now, we don't care. UVA, UVB, all these different UV spectrums. All we care about is UVC. And the reason why is, again, these bullet points on the right-hand side here, it is the most concentrated form. The advantage of being the most concentrated form section of that UV light spectrum is, it is all, that makes it the most deadly. It's destructive. So when things like particulates pass through a duct stream or over a coil area, and there's already a UVC wavelength lamp shining in that area, it's immediately breaking down those particulates. Even though they're passing possibly at a relatively quick speed, over and over again, UVC light, that spectrum is very deadly to cellular health, cellular structure, et cetera. It's breaking things down. It is literally killing bacteria and killing viruses over and over and over again. Uh, so that's why we installed this type of technology, UVGI technology, using UVC wavelength uh, lamps in an HVAC system to create that repetitive effect. So the uh, purple sphere, this is just a great uh, little uh, example. So the very center of that sphere, that, that silver spot is the tip of a lamp. So that's just showing you if you had to, if you could imagine seeing light emanating outward from a lamp, um, we basically say the you want 12 inches or less. So if obviously if I'm addressing a coil solution, I want to keep a coil that's inside that HVAC equipment clean. Great. I want to get those lamps as close as possible because the closer that surface area is to that lamp, the more deadly it is, right? So that's what they're just giving you. Hey, here's an example, right? A standard UVC lamp might have uh, 1200 micro watts of intensity a foot away. But obviously when I get within, you know, a couple of inches, I'm, now I'm down to like anywhere from 30,000 to, you know, 5,000, uh, Microwatts. So long story short, the closer, the better. Um, now, here's the cool thing. Even though it's so concentrated, it dissipates very quickly. That goes back into the distance as well. So if I mount, if I'm trying to keep a coil and inhibiting growth in the summertime, and I mount that coil like two feet away, which to be fair, most HVAC systems, it's kind of hard to mount it two feet away unless you're in a commercial system. Most residential systems, I mean, Jason, you know, you got to find space to fit these lamps in there. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Like the when you worked on my system, I have, I think it's what a Z coil, right? It's not even an A coil. Yes. Yeah. So that was a little harder for us to, to fit them in, but we got them. Actually, we ended up putting two in on the coil. So uh, before we, it exited into the plenum. So, so that's just a great lesson on why there is different forms of UV light. UVC is the only go to. Uh, I'm going to call this out right now. People are on Amazon nowadays look, trying to look up UV lamps and doing their own DIY projects. I'm like, do not do that. Uh, also, if you buy UVA or UVB lamps, you're not at the same intensity as a UVC. So uh, there's all kinds of lamps coming out of China and other countries right now. I've seen them on Amazon. I see them everywhere. It's crazy. So trust that the fact that everything I'm discussing here today is pro trade. Everything that Ultravation makes is sold through a professional HVAC just distribution channel to a professional HVAC contractor like Haviland Mechanical. So if you find a way to buy it as a consumer, do not install it yourself. <laughs> Please do not. Uh, you could really burn your eyes and other problems. So anyway, so this is a quick review here. If you're installing a, a proper product that uses a proper UVC wavelength light, 
It's just a reminder that technically in this industry, you're applying UVGI technology to an HVAC system, whether it's on a coil. If I'm on a coil, great. I put a lamp by a coil. I've actually applied UVGI technology on the coil. Did I put it in the plenum for the main air supply to supply outward into the home or the business? Okay, fine. But I've applied UVGI technology products into the main air stream. Uh, if I'm talking commercial, there's other stuff in here on the bullet points, like upper room applications. That's I can get into that later. So long story short, if you're following the ASHRAE handbook and the ASHRAE guidelines, we're referring to UVGI technology. So there's your buzzword of the evening. All right. Now to clarify T3. So not all bulbs are created equal. We've just clarified that UVA and UVB are actually UV wavelengths, but they're not as deadly as UVC as far as getting a maximum kill rate. Well, now there's different classifications in how a bulb is made. So Ultravation patented a T3 bulb. They found a way to protect the bulb and gain even more intensity out of it. So they figured out that quartz does not block UV light. So they said, great, let's put that bulb and encapsulate it into a quartz sleeve. And then between those two layers, there's like a little insulation gas layer. The, the, the whole point here on that design is, well, now I've protected a bulb from dirt, moisture, anything else that could be going on a residential system, but even more importantly, a commercial system. And thanks to it being insulated in the wintertime, for example, I'm still going to get, or in the summertime, I'm getting the maximum cold air blowing. This bulb is not going to be as impacted by temperature changes because it's insulated. So if I'm, I'm pushing out peak cold air, I'm, not, I'm still going to get a good high burn rate out of this bulb because it's protected by that armor, so to speak. So that's why that graph there on the bottom right shows you a standard T3 bulb in the red zone. You're never going to go beyond 75 80% burn intensity because it's being affected by temperature. But thanks to this T3 design, you can actually get that bulb to hit peak 100% capacity, which you're going to get on average about 40% more energy. Actually, here's a zoomed in shot. So there you go. So you can see how the bulb has actually been encased inside of another layer. So long story short here, I like to clarify that even our products, we have some entry level stuff that are just non T3 lamps. And then we have our higher end residential products that are T3 standard. And our commercial, most of our commercial line is all T3 standard. Um, now, will a non T3 bulb still be effective? Absolutely. The biggest thing I like to clarify from a PM cycle, I'm using industry terms, but preventative maintenance is if you did not install a T3 bulb, it's a standard UVC wavelength bulb, then you should be coming back every single year and changing that bulb. That is a 9,000 hour life cycle bulb. But if you're installing T3, technically you got two years life. That's an 18,000 hour life bulb. So whether it's a 9,000 or, or 18,000 T3 class bulb, most manufacturers, including us, uh, because we have Philips make almost all of our bulbs, that's one of the biggest bulb manufacturers in the world. The bulbs are guaranteed, I air quote, guaranteed for two years. What, I'm, what the guarantee is, is that it's going to light up. But I have to educate people. If you didn't install a T3 bulb and you're trying to milk out extra life out of your lamp, you're, 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 you're confused. You do not want to be doing that because once you've hit that one-year life cycle, you've already burned a lot of the intensity out of that lamp. You need to get that thing changed out. Once you're past that one-year life cycle, I think the last time I checked the math is you've already used up over 40 to 50% of that bulb's potential. So... If you, if you failed to get the contractor like Haller Mechanical back in there to swap those bulbs out, well, now I'm past the one-year cycle. Now I'm just on a down curve of efficiency. I'm not getting the same kill rate out of these bulbs. So you need to make sure you're changing them properly. Like I said, if it's not a T3 every single year, if it is T3, great, hit them every other year and you're fine. So that's up to obviously you, Jason, um, on how you design your IAQ packages and what people want to pay for, right? Um, now, granted, filtration, you're going to come back. If you're using a MERV, three, MERV 13, five-inch filter, I might be coming in and changing them, depending on how dirty the house is. Maybe it's quarterly. Uh, I change mine twice a year. It's just myself, my wife, and a dog. We don't have a huge square footage. So I have a MERV 13s down there, and I change them out every six months. Uh, but when it comes to the lamps, I've got all T3 lamps installed. So every two years, we get swap lamps. So pretty simple. How are we doing so far? Good. Pretty good. All right. Those, those filters, the five inch pleated, I recommend every season. So if your okay. system is just air conditioning, do it once a year. If it does air conditioning and heat, twice a year. 
Okay. So, uh, so I'm following your protocol. <laughs> You're right on the money. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I just kind of guessed they, at that. But. <laughs> they'll be okay for a year, but I still recommend every six months. Actually, that. thank you. So our literature from the factory even says, uh, you know, can you get a year out of it? Absolutely. But they exactly. recommend at the bare minimum, you're changing them every six months. Now, the average person with one inch filters, honestly, I mean, J Jason, on average, how often should somebody actually be changing those cheap filters? Every time you get your power bill. Right. So literally monthly, but the average person's not doing that. At every all. 30 days. Yep. Yeah. The average no. person's going to wait three months, four months. Now you're choking the system up and all kinds Pretty of things. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I tell people like, you might be saving money because those filters you think are cheap. But if you're actually changing them as often as you should be every single month, you're basically spending the same amount of money, but not getting anywhere near the air quality. So I'm always trying to remind people that, yes, are these higher end filters more expensive? Sure. But instead of me changing them every single month, now I'm changing it once a year or sorry, twice a year. Okay, well, but I'm actually trapping things as small as auto emissions. Like that's how good these filters are. Like you're actually trapping microscopic particulates, viruses, bacteria, uh, obviously viruses are big right now, but even things like auto emissions and smells, it's pretty powerful what these filters can do. So I tell people like, great, you think you're saving money by buying these cheapo filters, but you're, most people aren't changing them as often. So your IAQ is in the toilet. You need to just upgrade, get a proper filter solution in place. So, all right. This fun graph came off of our com commercial literature. I just like to show it because it shows a great example of how in the blue, is uh, surface area contamination like bacteria, things that grow on surfaces. And the green is more airborne concerns like airborne viruses, right? So at the bottom here, you got things like streptococcus or like E. coli, things like that. That's all stuff that grows on surfaces. So the reason why we use this graph commercially is at the bottom there, it says UV matrix SI. SI stands for surface. And then UV matrix AS. AS stands for airstream. So we educate at the commercial level because we make racks of UV bulbs, big racks for like hospitals and everything. And great, if you're just trying to solve for a surface area concern, fine, you have plenty of UV intensity coming off of a coil application to kill streptococcus or E. coli or uh, all these other types of uh, back, yeah, tuberculosis, right? Actually, here you go. That, that version of tuberculosis, you're going to get a 93% kill rate on a coil design product, right? Because technically the coil is still in the airstream. Air is passing by the coil. You have UV light emanating outward. You're still gonna get some kill zone benefit. But as you climb this chart into more aggressive and dangerous airborne viruses, then you need to have a proper airstream solution in the air supply beyond the coil. That's why we start showing how those percentages drop off as you get into things like influenza A, uh, diphtheria. You get to the top here, e echovirus. Ecovirus is very, very dangerous. People are freaked out about COVID. You do not want ecovirus. So if we just had a coil application, we're only at a 23, barely a 24% kill rate uh, on, on echovirus. We have to have something in the system as well as something in the air supply because when it comes to IAQ and killing things, when it comes to UV light, it's about, it's about the equation here is time and intensity. So when you start getting into Airstream solutions, it's about how much intensity you're getting out of that. And in a lot of our commercial applications, I'll show you in a little bit, you have like multiple bulbs in a row, right? We're just daisy chaining bulbs that get you maximum kill rates because you have these high, high flow systems, high levels of CFMs. I mean, Jason, what's one of the fastest CFMs you've ever worked on on a commercial system? Uh, about thousands of feet per minute, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. High velocity, high statics, but I mean, 60 yeah, times. What's an average home speed of air, right? I mean, compared to a commercial application. Yeah, you're going from a three ton unit to a 160 ton unit. I mean, right. Yeah. Whole Nowhere different near. level. Whole different yeah. level. Yeah. Yep. So, so here, here's just a quick high little overview of all the different types of like ways we can address residential. And I'm not going to go crazy about all of them, but obviously I always like to show fil right there is filtration, right? A proper MERV 11, 32 square feet. Uh, we even have, a, and obviously MERV 13 is the better, but now you're addressing large particulates. Like let's stop the large particulates as they're coming through the return from the rooms in your home before they get into the HVAC system. That way they can't even get onto the coil and possibly grow, right? But then we get into things like surface area uh, microparticulates, the molecular level and the biological, working our way around that sphere. That's when you start adding in things like UV light, ionization, all that type of technology. So 
this is just a high level shot. I just love showing, helping people understand that there's different sizes of particulates and there's different ways of trapping them and obviously killing them. So eventually we wanna to get to that, that really intense molecular biological level if you really care about indoor air quality. So, and we make all different kinds of stuff. I'm gonna breeze through these. Uh, this is all stuff available on our site, but we have coil recommendations like the Advantage. This is our throwaway product design. We make it in a regular non-T3 and T3 version. So one year life or two year life. But we we were the first company to figure out a way to take the high-end bulbs and say, wait, if nobody wants to pay for all this high-end crazy tech, they just, they're just trying to get bulbs in their system. Let's develop a throwaway design that's always in warranty. So Jason, when you come back to the job site, you literally grab that black module, take the screws and just pull the whole thing out and throw it away and slap a whole new module in. There's no, now granted, you don't have all these extra bells and whistles like, lamp monitoring technology and auto off sensors that will power it off if you've not changed it out soon enough and it's already past your year. Like we have systems that'll do that. It's like, well, you haven't changed the bulb. So there's no point even keeping it lit up. Let's shut it down. Like our technology can get that smart. Now granted, let's get the higher price tag. So this is that, this is your best access point. That's why we call it the advantage. Let's get somebody something at, and I don't like to call it cheap. I'm saying the most affordable we can, throw away design, keep it simple. We even give the option of throwing on a little PCO module if they want to get some extra air, air deodorization, some extra photocatalytic oxidation in there. But in the end, this is very entry level. Um, we beef it up a little bit. We actually have a beefed up version that adds even more surface area with the titanium dioxide to have even more PCO if that's what their goals are. But these aren't scalable. Uh, this one and this one, you have to wire each one of these individually. Now, Jason, when you worked on my system, the first thing you installed after the filtration was this. So this is the high-end uh, coil application. This is our signature series. So this is, you know, comes with a nice magnetic mount. I've got a light reflection shield, so I can direct that light directly onto the coil surface area. It's got a, its own power module. It's got a, uh, it's got lamp monitoring on it, and it's scalable. I can add a secondary bulb accessory on, which is what Jason did on my Z coil. I want to get two bulbs over top of that Z coil, so I can cover the whole thing with as much UV light as possible. So he only had to wire one thing. He had to wire that power module. And then that power module actually powered two lamps. So before he even ever had an induct solution, he at least helped me get cover my coil solution. This is pre-COVID. I never got, got around to putting anything into my air supply until later. But this is our best coil solution. It's scalable. You can get it in 12 inch, 17 inch. If you want to run it solo, you want to run a double, it's good for that. So now we make other stuff too. I mean, I don't dwell on this. We make... Uh, a lot of people are into these electronic, you know, tech, electronic air filters. If they want that, we make something for that too. We have stuff with UV and filtration built into the same box. Um, it, it even can power coil lamps as well. That's called our Photronic. So this is where we kind of combine UV and filtration all in the same entity. But you still need to get proper UV light and uh, and air supply systems into your main duct supply too. But that's still addressing from the return coming in. Uh, but then this is what uh, Jason put in my house. So. This is the catalyst. This is one of our top end residential air supply products. So this one is basically there's there's one byproduct that comes off of UV light and photocatalytic oxidation, something called ozone. Jason, you and I talked about it a lot. Uh, the cool thing about the T3 bulbs, though, is here's something I learned about UV bulbs. UV bulbs have a burn in cycle. So standard UVC lamps. The first 100 hours, there's a burn in cycle for all lamps. And there could be a slight sensitivity because they're going to give off a slight amount of ozone as the bulbs burn in. And there's all different types of ozone. The average populace aren't sensitive to it. But I think, Jason, you even noticed that you might have been a little sensitive to ozone and you're a professional. Um, but I, I, have, I don't notice it at all. So the cool thing about the T3 is that it's, in, it's encapsulated in the quartz sleeve. So that whole burn-in cycle, you'll never notice the ozone because it's trapped inside the bulb. So right there is one another advantage of T3. I don't have any ozone byproduct, but the secondary technology, PCO, that does give off, photo, the photocatalytic oxidation process also gives off a little bit of ozone. But this module has three full strips of carbon. Those are carbon modules, those black bricks, and they have the titanium dioxide infused into them. So because it's carbon, carbon absorbs that. So there's basically two types of PCO. There's active, and there's passive. This is a passive product because it technically gives off ozone, but then absorbs it right back into itself. So you, if you have somebody who has any possible concern with being sensitive to ozone, this is what you put in. You'll never have to worry about it. 
because I know eventually we're going to move and rent this property. So I never want to have to worry about it. That's why I put this one in. Uh, now, and the other cool thing about these higher end products are lifetime warrantied and you can add on the coil lamp. That's the other advantage of this. Like even though the last slide I showed you, you know, we, uh, two slides ago here, I, I decided to put two lamps in off this module. If I was putting all this in from the get go from day one, I wouldn't even have to put this in. I could have that same accessory lamp on the right there. I could plug right into this power head. So the catalyst will power a coil lamp. So again, from an ease of install standpoint, I only have to wire one product. I, I power, I, I wire up the catalyst power head and then it's a Y jack with that accessory lamp that plugs right into that power head. So that power head will take care of the main system and the coil lamp accessory. So you can still get UV on the coil. And now you're going and you're following the ASHRAE guidelines of a coil solution for surface area and airstream solution for the main plenum. So again, uh, Jason, you installed this in my house. So <laughs> looks familiar. Um, now, <laughs> The only thing that beats this technology wise, but is a active PCO product is our top seller right now is a Solaris. So this thing has been selling like hotcakes, but again, it's active PCO. There's no carbon on this, but the reason why it's the most high tech is now we've added in that infamous ionization technology too. So this thing doesn't just have the UV production uh, and actually they, they doubled the surface area. So there's actually two wraps of metal around that ballast. It's two layers thick and all the metal has titanium dioxide on it and it's got the beefier bulb in it. But then there's also four electrodes in there generating ionization. So now you've got that invisible ionization in the air as well, doing its breakdown thing, helping particulates stick together, helping the filtration process. So this thing would be right now the most high tech residential solution we have on the market. And it actually competes, again, still scalable, by the way, that powerhead, just like the catalyst, they both come with the ability to add on that accessory lamp for the coil. So these are our top end air supply treatment systems. It's either, hey, do I want passive with carbon catalyst, but there's no ionization on it? Or do I want all the bells and whistles? I want the ionization, but it's going to be an active PCO. But that's okay. This is scalable. When you take this powerhead off, there's an adjustment rod on there. I can scale this from 500 square feet of treatment out to 5,000 square feet of treatment. They figured out a specific sleeve that's inside that ballast that will block uh, some of the most intense areas of the lamp to help reduce some of that, uh, that ozone byproduct coming off. You're still getting all the benefits of the UV. You're just not blocking that in the airstream. So, uh, but that's, that's, that's a scalable solution, but we can't technically sell it as a passive PCO because there's no carbon. So, uh, but we, we invented this because, and we have a separate PDF I can send you guys, but long story short, some of the top competitors out there like APCO and uh, RGF's Remy Halo are a real, they've done a great job marking that product. I won't bash my competition, uh, but our Solaris blows all of them out of the water. We have twice as much ionization. We have twice as much UV. This thing just crushes the competition. So uh, so that so anyway, we have a separate uh, sheet on that. Cause I'm sure Jason in your travels to all the distributors, I'm sure you've seen the Remy halo on display. Yes. I've seen. Yes. Yeah. By the way, I think our lead times are better right now as well. So <laughs> they, they, <laughs> yeah. they, they did a great job selling it so bad that it's like a lot longer to get. So um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what would be the price point on average between the active and the passive for the homeowner? What are you we're, seeing? We're pretty much the same. Oh, really? It's literally just, what, what do you want? <laughs> that's, that's, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll show you guys the pricing later because I don't share that on video because obviously you guys, you know, have your pro trade world. But as far as in the end, it, they're both the, the top end induct solution. It's just, do I want active, want passive? Okay. Right? Because it takes, it's a little bit more expensive to make those carbon bricks and get them infused with the titanium dioxide. Whereas on the metal ballast, they just coat that on the metal surface. So, but then the metal ballast, Inside that, they've added the ionization, so there's more components on the Solaris. So they found a way to offset the cost and say, great, well, you saved money by not having an ionization, but we gave you carbon, or we give up the carbon, but we add ionization. Gotcha. Right. So, so it's, 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 it's just, it's, hey, what do you want, active or passive? So, uh, and not at, most of our competition can't even offer that. Most competitions are not doing that. So, like on that APCO product here, they only have one strip of carbon. So I, I wish I had the catalyst on here to, to kind of play, could compare them all across the board uh, because the catalyst blows away the APCO product. So, uh, but again, both of our top end solutions. Now, for your benefit, we even make stuff portable. So I know there's been homes you've gone into, Jason, where 
uh, especially in the Poconos, right? There's a lot of people using uh, fossil fuels, right? Wood burning stoves, things of that nature. They might not have, they might not have, because they have beautiful cold mountain air, they might not have cooling. Uh, my teammate that I train in New England, he lives in New Hampshire. His house does not have air conditioning at all. They just open their windows. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. In those situations, where are you going to install UV? You know? So, so we made a portable air purifier. This thing is only nine inches by nine inches by three inches high, but it's a perfect room by room solution. It's got a small turbine fan on the bottom of the chassis that pulls air up underneath, you know, through the rubber feet. And then inside there's a washable air filter, a UVC lamp, and right through those holes in the front is a full strip of those carbon bricks with the titanium dioxide. So this, this little bad boy gives you filtration plus UV plus photocatalytic oxidation. And because it's carbon, it's a passive unit. So we invented this a long time ago. It's been through like five redesigns, but this thing is super popular for gyms, locker rooms, uh, dorm rooms. Uh, uh, Je Jennifer right now, who founded our firm, she keeps it in her kid's room because he's known to have allergies. So uh, this thing pretty much uh, negated all of his allergies. So, and this is, you know, this is before COVID. So it's a great little product. I actually have had uh, contractors use this just to, prove to somebody that the technology works and say, Hey, let's pick the worst room in your house. Maybe you're taking time to think about it. I'll stick that in there, plug it in there. Like just give it a couple of days, especially if somebody normally sleeps in there. And you tell me if you have not improved, if you had an allergy problem or somebody's usually sick a lot, like just, it's a great product to prove that. So again, I'm sure you guys have customers that probably could use this at a certain area of their home, or they don't have the ability to put normal coil applications in or whatever. So. Yeah, and, it, and it's and it's brushed stainless steel, so it actually looks nice. So mm -hmm. um, it's not it's not, it's, it's not ugly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Jason, you and I worked together a lot over the years on ductless. So obviously, we have the very popular universal kit for ductless. Um, you know, just basically mount the sucker up in there, and you're good to go. So mini split ductless market's huge. That's also something that again depends on the house. Some people have don't have ducted airflow everywhere. Uh, this is very popular. People put them into additions. They put them into garage spaces, or they've literally done this to their whole home and they've zoned, they zoned the ductless. I know in the next year or so that rental unit, Jason, I want to put ductless in, right? Yeah. So she, she has no ducted air work. So the only way to get me to get, to get my tenant UV solutions is to put a ductless head in. So I can put this in the ductless head or give her that, that room unit that I just showed you the UVP 6,000. What's that called? The portable air purifier. So there's no way to get her increased air, air quality she's got baseboard heat and window air conditioners so yeah okay. so that's my master plan all right <clears throat> the video earlier when i talked about ionization that's what that is that's the orion so there's no uv at all its job is just to generate the positive and negative ions it's called bipolar ionization uh, it can be mounted inside the hvac equipment or on the outside of the hvac equipment because the electrodes are can flip down so you can actually flip them down. And if you don't have the room inside the equipment, great, stick it there. A lot of people put them by the blower motors. A lot of people put them on the returns right before the filter, up to you. But if people are looking to like add as much tech into a system, maybe you've already put all the UV in. Maybe you finally upgrade the filtration. Maybe you're not using our electrostatically charged filters. Well, okay, fine. If you have a non-electrostatically charged filter, then I would put an Orion ion generator in to give you that ability to start getting particulates drawn into the filter and sticking to things. So, so that's, uh, that thing is good for up to on average five to 6,000 square feet. So if you start getting into commercial applications, you just put more than one in and, and we're actually looking at releasing a new commercial version. It's going to be bigger and beefier, but they're just trying to keep up with demand right now. It's, it's crazy. So, uh, the IQ market has exploded. So, um, obviously we talked about filtration. You know, those five inch filters can go into straight throughs, right angles, support boxes. Uh, we do all the custom paint. We'll put your logos on it. We do everything. We'll make sure those things match the brand of equipment you install. You name it, we do it. Um, when did you start carrying that bottom box? Always had it. Did for you? years. Oh, yeah. For years. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Um, oh, that's that's our that's our bread and butter, man. People are like, what? You, you make those? Because most guys fabricate them out of sheet metal. I, I literally go to one distributor I don't care for just to buy that box and, and leave. We'll talk about that offline okay. <laughs> because I now no, have it's not that your in. box. It's a different brand, but yours is probably oh, better. No. Yours is, yours is oh nice. yeah. A lot of companies have realized that 
no one beats this. This is because we, I mean, you can get them naked, but we make them galvanized. If they want to go completely bare bones, just get that support benefit. But the proper way to buy this is they're fully insulated on the inside. They're fully gasketed. They, all of our boxes always come with the first filter already installed. And then it's up to them if they want to have them. Like some of our distributors, they, they literally stock them already painted to match their brand of equipment. Uh, and then we sell them standard as white. But then we, uh, some of our bigger contractors, they start bringing some of their own stock in. We'll just say, hey, what brand of equipment do you want to match to? We have all the paint codes. We don't care. So this is all built right in Vermont where everything else is. So yeah, I can get you more information on that. Yeah, that the, the sport box is like, everybody says like, dude, we, that's our, no one can beat that. I got guys that are installing straight throughs and right angles from other companies, but they only use our support box. So yeah, I figured you'd like that. <laughs> so they, that, that. Now where I go all the time, he couldn't find, Larry couldn't find that for me. All right. Let's talk offline. I'll, I'll resolve that for you real fast. So yeah, all right, very good. <laughs> um, so that kind of resolves uh, residential. The commercial is super fast. Like I'm gonna rip through this because residential is so many options nowadays. I didn't even show you everything this company makes, but commercial is really simple. It's like, hey, it's coil and airstream. Like this is some of the key products, and some of the stuff is so big. Maybe you're light commercial. I mean, when you, Jason, when you target commercial, are you staying on the light commercial side? You're not working on the big big stuff, are you? Mm, not like the walk-in units some okay I so some, i have the i have, i do i'm a sub for the university so i get some of the big stuff but okay that's pretty much all the stuff. then you may you're going to see all this would apply to a university i was just doing a major job up in uh, binghamton new york for a university so uh like the upper left hand unit here is a big rack of bulbs that we make so Long story short, like this is a zoomed in shot using T3. Um, and this is just how these bulbs mount up on our SI racks. So we're like that upper left-hand one here, like that's meant for big stacked coils. Like you could walk in, it's like two coils high or three coils high by two, three coils wide. So you might end up needing, if it's a two by three, you're going to need, you know, well, six, six racks of bulbs. Like that's a lot of bulbs, but that's what you need to keep all the surface areas from inhibiting growth. So and obviously, because it's benefiting the airstream, you're going to get that. But so, we, and we have, we have all this on YouTube. Again, there's that graph again, the blue and the green. This is a mock up showing you those racks of SI racks on the big stack coils. Like these are big solutions. Um, the first time I ever saw this in person was eight years ago on the rooftop of a Philadelphia library. They had us go in with tape measures to measure all the coils and figure out the racks because they had uh, a black spores growing inside the casings of the unit. And they don't want to risk, you know, obviously getting people sick in the library. And they also said it actually has improved the life of the books as well in the library. So, uh, but this is how you keep coils clean on large commercial solutions. And then obviously in that mock-up, you can see uh, down here in the Airstream, a, uh, a daisy chaining of bulbs. That's our AS model. So I'll, I'll show you here. So there's the SI and you can get it with drain pans and everything else, depending on how much moisture is coming off these things. Uh, we have all this stuff on file, by the way, but you can get them with um, intensity monitoring accessories. You can get them with an own control panel that have LEDs. So if guys want to be able to walk by and not even look into the systems to see if they're working, you can get all that remote monitoring. Uh, some guys get these little cutaway glasses on the door. So they just look in through the door and see that everything is lit and they're fine. So again, this is actually all of our T3 tech. So you're going to be changing these lamps like every two years. So, uh, but again, you're inhibiting bio growth. You are getting some airstream benefit, but this is primarily designed for coil surface area, right? You're not getting that daisy chained airstream benefit. Um, again, here's your accessories, control panels, uh, real time UV monitoring can be put into place. Depends what the customer wants, right? More bells and whistles they want to pay for, it's up to them. Um, here's the AS model. This is probably the most inv involved that I got to deal with right now because if people are asking for specific levels of disinfection rate, especially addressing COVID on a commercial property, if they, if they say COVID, I got to, first of all, I have a special quote sheet I'll send you, but if they ask to solve and want an exact specification and percentage for COVID, I have to send that to the factory and that's got to be quoted by the engineers there. Uh, but this is an example of an AS. So you get one main supply duct, you just have to drill pilot holes for the lamps. All the electronics are sitting outside the airstream. We don't put anything into the airstream, even on those SI racks all the wiring is on the left and the right. We're trying to keep as much stuff out of the airstream as possible. So that way there's no inhibiting of the airstream flow, right? You're getting maximum CFMs. Um, 
these ASs, can, you can get them in three bulbs, four bulbs, six bulbs, uh, depending on how big the main supply duct is. Sometimes I got to put more than one of these, like one on the left, one on the right, and the lamps have to meet in the middle. Um, we have some big, pretty long bulbs, but in the end, on a, on a main supply duct, solving the airstream level for airborne viruses, you, you're only allowed a four inch um, flexibility area. So like where the lamp tip ends, you're only allowed a four inch gap. If you have anything more than that, I have to add a second array of bulbs in and we have to find a way to meet in the middle. You can't have extra, all that extra space past the bulbs. So the whole point of that daisy chain bulb effect, it goes back to that equation of time and intensity. So if the air is moving super, super fast, we want as many bulbs in a row as possible to give you a maximum kill zone, right? So the air is moving over bulb one, bulb two, bulb three. You're getting that repetitive kill rate uh, out of these bulbs. So, so this is your solution for a big main supply duct. Um, these, this is something newer we came out with this year. So we wanted to create, bring some of that PCO benefit into these smaller package units. These are popular in um, like multifamily construction. I don't know if you ever worked on any jobs like that, uh, but you can get these in one bulb, two bulb uh, arrays. It basically, as you can see here at the bottom, you can go from you know one to three ton systems to three to 7.5 and then eight to 20 ton systems. So small compact units, different length bulbs. And then you got these PCO cages over them to give you some of that photocatalytic oxidation. So this was something new we're really starting to see take off. Uh, Cause prior to that, if we were dealing with small stuff on rooftops. So here's something popular for rooftops. If you can't fit the big racks of bulbs in, that's fine. You can get a one or a two bulb unit like this. This is our UV matrix 4X. Uh, the reason why it's called 4X is because that plastic enclosure is a NEMA 4X enclosure. It's completely waterproof. It's NEMA 4X rated. Again, all the electronics sitting outside the airstream, you're just getting the bulbs inside to be near those coils and in the airstream. And these things, there's only six options. You get them in one or two bulb, and you can get them in 12, 22 inch or 33 inch length lamps. Again, you're trying to fit the longest possible bulb inside that unit as possible to give you as much UV light as possible over top of that service area. So Quick obviously question. the, the yeah. 33 inch lamp, does that unit support the bulb itself or is there something yep. inside that supports it? No, it's a good question. It's a pretty long bulb, right? No, but again, okay. thanks to the T3 bulb design, you've got the original bulb encapsulation for structural integrity, plus the quartz sleeve for structural integrity as well. So that it is hang there. I mean, it's pretty impressive actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that's the first thing I asked when they when they trained me on this a long time ago. I was like, "That's a long bulb. Is is it gonna like <laughs> it's gonna blow right over? <laughs> right? Is it gonna break off?" And they said, "No, you're fine." So uh, that's why we don't go beyond 33 on these. Now the SI racks are we got we got bulbs that can reach you know 50, 60 inches. I mean, it's some yeah. pretty big bulbs out there. Those obviously have extra support. Uh, those are our easy light kits. So we actually will say, even though these are these all these bells and whistles, if you literally know what you're doing. You could just buy the big long bulbs with the wiring and you can custom build your own thing. But the average average contractor is, is picking the right kit for the right solution. But we do make easy light kits where all the bulbs by themselves in case they have to do something unique. So um, the last thing I got to review for you is upper room. Until 2020, I never talked about this. And until two months ago, it didn't even look like this. It was a white box. It was a single skew item. It was used over in Europe. But now, thanks to COVID and all these airborne concerns, we said, okay, we need to find a way to address, address convective airflow, right? Hot air rises, cold air falls in wide open occupied spaces, right? So even, so you know, there's, there could be duct work supplying that area. How do we increase safety in a large wide open room like a church uh, or a lobby? So these are upper room boxes. There's no motors, there's no fans, there's nothing. Literally inside those boxes is just a bulb. And the louvers direct the light straight across the top of the ceiling. So that's why it's called upper room. This is not mounted at eye height. This is above eye height, shining straight across the ceiling. And there's obviously a minimum room size, but there's three different versions of it now because of room capacity. So again, the first two are wall mounts, uh, 225 square feet or 350 square feet. Then there's a center room here, that big one on the bottom. That's because there's louvers on the front and the back. So the bottom, that third unit there is actually has two long bulbs inside of it. One on the back side, one on the front side. You would mount that in the center of the room. So you're getting benefits in both directions. Uh, and again, we'll powder coat them. Well, they can, I mean, once they come, you can pay them to match, I don't know, your restaurant's design or whatever you want to do. But this was something huge in Europe for years. Uh, upper room is called out in the ASHRAE handbook too. And I'll show you a couple of images in a second. 
Uh, but this is this is, gives you an example of how the irradiation process uh, protrudes invisibly across the room. So it has to be at minimum seven to eight feet above uh, at the highest point of the wall. But this is how the light emanates outward. Obviously, that's why we also have to look at if you have a big enough room, you might need a box on the one side of the room and a box on the other side of the room and have the light meet across in the middle if the room is big enough. So these are very large rooms, mind you. But the whole point here is the closer to the box you are, the faster the kill rate of whatever's in that airflow. So this is called upper room irradiance. Um, again, ASHRAE handbook. These are shots I took right out of the handbook, chapter 62. It gives you an example of how that light is emanating across the room above your head. This is an old photograph from an old, this hospital was torn down and rebuilt, but this is the old St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City. They use these in their cafeteria. This was back in the times of tuberculosis, a lot of airborne TB concerns. Uh, actually, the next shot here for here is a major hallway uh, in, a, in a CDC in the Brazil. So this was a, a tuberculosis facility. So they had these above every single doorway. So this technology has actually been around a long time. It just fell out of popularity and now is making a comeback. So this is a great way, great way to add in extra IAQ in large wide open spaces. So um, again, that's an example of room design. So that concludes residential, commercial. Um, if you ever come across a commercial application, I have a special spreadsheet that I'll send you guys that will need to be filled out so we can properly quote it because then we can figure out all the calculations, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but I know I covered a lot tonight. Um, what kind of questions may you guys have? And again, we can follow up more later too, so. Do you have any questions? I think I'm good for now, Scott. Um, I think this is right up your really alley. Because like, Katie, you're very medically like wired thanks to your, yeah. your, your, your career history. So I figured you'd be able to wrap your head around this stuff actually relatively quick. No, this was really good. Really good information. Thank you. Yeah. Now, Jason, uh, from what we discussed, please, I mean, we'll figure out what to follow up on. Obviously, uh, filtration boxes, obviously, um, how to put together an offering. I always tell people what you should really just, especially right now in these current times, let's re let's lead with the best solution. And then your consumer will decide, okay, well, fine, here's where I'm at. Now, if you need to cut costs, understand that, okay, if we take this way, you lose this. If you take this way, you lose that. Or so you have to understand, like, you got to start with the best and then take away. Yeah. I don't play that bottom up thing on this type of solution. When it comes to IAQ, you got to give them the proper solution and then let them make the decision of what they want to remove or take out of the equation. Because if I was the contractor, I want you signing off on that. Like, you understand that I, I presented you the proper solution, but if you don't want to spend this, I got to take this way and take this way and you're only going to get this. So, and that's okay. You got to meet people where they're at. Um, yes. So, and that's, that's just the way the industry is. So, uh, I think it's but, a matter of educating them too over just selling something. Exactly. Exactly. More. So, well, that being said, uh, let me, I'll close it out here and we can shut our, our recording down for the night. Again, thank you. So again, ladies and gentlemen, if everyone watches this video on our YouTube channel and or the Facebook world or whatever, that's Howler and Mechanical here <laughs> serving the, uh, the Pocono region in the greater Leah Valley area. And uh, again, we have lots of other training videos on our YouTube channel, but that covers all residential, all commercial, obviously specifically from Ultravation uh, based in Vermont right here in the Northeast US. If you need any other further, just obviously sales management solutions so we can cover a uh, lot of training and that's my life. So thanks for tuning in. I'm gonna shut this down. Thank you. Thank you. And.